Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we talk to the change agents trying to make Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the world a more vibrant and inclusive place. I'm your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And today, our guest is serial entrepreneur, writer, and community activist, Carlos Moreno, who by day is the graphic designer for Cap Tulsa, but by night is the author of The Victory of Greenwood, a project that includes a book coming out next May, articles that you can read right now on their website, museum exhibits, which will be coming out soon after this episode drops, and hopefully a podcast. This project endeavors to tell the story of Greenwood from the perspective of the heroes and entrepreneurs who built Greenwood and then rebuilt it after its destruction. We talked to Carlos about the untold story of the rebirth of Greenwood, how we can learn from our past to move forward, and how he still loves animation despite crying during Fox and Hound. It's a rough first animation film. Enjoy the conversation, everybody. We are very excited to have Carlos Moreno on the podcast today. Carlos, how you doing? Doing great. Doing great. So you have a multitude of jobs, but the reason we have you on the podcast today is because you're working on a project that is called The Victory of Greenwood. Can you summarize what this project is for our listeners? It's been a project that's been a long time coming. It started actually in 2001. I was asked by the Oklahoma Eagle at the time to help come up with a special issue that would cover the contents of the Race Massacre Commission report, which was being released in September of that year. They wanted something in the special issue that would be more um, accessible to their readership. If you've ever read the Tulsa Race Massacre report, it, it's dense. It's There's hundreds of pages. It's really academic. And so they wanted really something that was more accessible to their general readership. And so I worked with Lewis Gray, who was a managing editor, Jim Goodwin, and his brother, E.L. Gunwood Jr., Don Ross, and several others in the community. And the story of Greenwood has just stuck with me ever since. I've been collecting books and articles and everything and any, anything I can get my hands on regarding Greenwood for the last uh, 20 years. A couple of years ago, my business partner, Meg Sutherland, and I kind of were having this conversation and I had recently read Shamari Will's Black Fortunes, which is an excellent book if you haven't read it. Uh, we were thinking, I've got all this stuff. What if we put it together into something you know that's tangible and we kicked around, should it be a podcast? Should it be a book? Should it be a video? What, is, what should this be? finally settled on a book and going about it in a little bit of a different of a way. We're actually releasing every chapter of the book as a, as an article online. So we're building a plane as we uh, fly it. <laughs> so we're releasing these articles. Uh, they're going out on the, the Tulsa Star newspaper, which the Tulsa Star currently is being run by a great woman journalist by the name of Tamita Norman. And so she's been very supportive. Interestingly enough, and for people who know who the Richard Lloyd Jones family is, who were the founders of the Tulsa Tribune and wrote this sort of inflammatory article against Dick Rowland that kind of kicked off the series of events that led to the massacre in a way that's part of the story. We'll, we'll probably get into a little bit more of the story later on. But the Lloyd Jones family has an endowment at my church at All Souls Unitarian Church and the church has agreed to publish the book. So we're taking all these articles and compiling them together into into a book that'll be released in May of next year. So coinciding with the centennial. They're related to the race massacre. There's this narrative that when it happened, Greenwood died and that's the end of the story. So I know one of the things that you're tackling is the rest of the story, the rebirth and growth of Greenwood beyond that. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it's so important to tell that story? Yeah, absolutely. So that was one of the things that Meg and I were looking at. And in my collection, I have probably close to 20 books at this point that are all about the massacre. So if you wanted to know what happened between May 31st and June 2nd of 1921, there's a couple of dozen books that you can easily find at any library or, you know, Amazon or anywhere and everywhere. And probably the most comprehensive and, and detailed book is Randy Crable's book that was released last year. He's an editor, uh, a journalist at the Tulsa World, and he sort of went through all the Tulsa World and Tulsa Tribune articles during the time and pulled out a lot of details that hadn't been really looked at closely in the past. But what he didn't do is look at the two black newspapers that were being published at the time. Um, and that was the Oklahoma Sun and the Tulsa Star. And what you can find in those newspapers are discussions and court cases where the black community really fought for the right to rebuild their own neighborhood. I just finished an article and it should be 
should be online here in the next week or so, but it's about B.C. Franklin, who is the grandfather of John W. Franklin, who founded the Smithsonian National Museum of History and Culture. And his father, John Hope Franklin, is very well known, not only in the Tulsa community, but nationwide, worldwide, as a historian and an author. And so B.C. Franklin filed a lawsuit against the mayor of Tulsa and the Tulsa Commission. Today, we call it Tulsa Council, City Council. So a black attorney to file a lawsuit against the mayor and the city council was pretty, like a lot of courage to do that, but he was successful. And a panel of three judges at the county level ruled that Tulsa didn't have the right to prevent property owners in Greenwood from rebuilding. And so they did. John and Lula Williams, who owned a confectionery, a, a sweet shop, and a couple of movie theaters were the first ones to rebuild in the business district. In fact, if you look at, if you look up <laughs> at the building that's at the corner of Greenwood and Archer, you'll see a big concrete uh, plaque at the very top of the building that says 1922. And so that was really their signal to the city that we're not going to back down, we're going to rebuild. And so the business district was rebuilt. Uh, and there's actually video footage of the business district from 1925 that you can look at this video footage and it's this bustling, amazing looking neighborhood. And it's all built back to as good, if not better than it was. And a lot of eyewitness accounts from the time say that Greenwood was built back to be better than it was before the, before the massacre. All the houses, if you look at the city directories, all but 15 houses were built back by the end of 1923. They built back in a very, it, it, it didn't take them a lot of time to really build back what they lost. And Greenwood thrived well up into the late 1960s. It's really urban renewal, the building of the highway, the IDL, Highway 244. It's really all those projects that kind of really put the nail in the coffin in Greenwood. If, if you want to talk about how, why Greenwood or why North Tulsa looks the way it does today, it, it really has more to do with the decisions that were made in late 1960s and early 1970s than, than what was done in 1921. So, Carlos, you and I have had this conversation, obviously off air before, but there's something that almost halfway through the sort of centennial year of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And we talked about how when you are centen not celebrating, but when you are on honoring or trying to discuss a horrific act over a long period of time, what happens is like the group that was attacked in that almost starts to feel strained by the trauma and how every the conversations we want to be having are about what to do what happened afterwards and what to do now and i say that from a, a jewish person perspective and thinking about the holocaust and how many times i've had to talk about it and how many times i've had to go to services about it or even when i had jobs where i had to talk about it all the time C can you discuss for you sort of your personal feeling for what happens when the worst thing to happen to the group is the thing people constantly want to talk about yeah, that's, that's definitely true, not just for, I don't mean to be divisive, but for white Tulsa as well as black Tulsa. Not only not only is the, is the city's sort of cultural narrative about Greenwood exactly what Chris described. Here was a thriving neighborhood. It was destroyed in 1921, and then nothing's ever happened since. And then the conversation shifts to what do we need to do today? And what you do in that is you dismiss 100 years worth of history, which is very rich. You miss the rebuilding of Greenwood. You miss sort of the conversation of how and why that happened and who allowed that to happen and who, who were the sort of people who stayed in Tulsa and fought for their neighborhood. You miss the conversations about building a sense of community. Today, urbanists, these sort of people who are really interested in building vibrant and diverse, thriving neighborhoods, all these buzzwords in city development and urban development, talk about this utopian vision of a neighborhood and what's the most striking to me is that Tulsa had that for almost 50 years. We had an incredibly diverse neighborhood, an incredibly dense neighborhood, a mixed use neighborhood where there were businesses and, and residents that were very close together. You had uh, a very walkable neighborhood. You had a neighborhood that had tons of public transportation. Simon Barry owned a taxi service and a bus service. So you, you had all of the ingredients that make up what today we are striving for vibrant pedestrian urban neighborhoods all across the country. And, and like I said, what's striking to me about this is Tulsa had that for almost 50 years and we ruined it. By building the IDL and by building Highway 244, we bulldozed literally thousands of homes and all those families were displaced. Then you have to have the conversation of what happens when you remove generational wealth from families 
And in the case of Greenwood, it happened not only once, but twice. There's a person that I focus on in one of my articles, Mabel Little, whose home and business was destroyed in 1921. And she went away for a while, came back to Tulsa, and then her business and home was destroyed again in, in 1971 to build a highway. So here's, here's a woman who's, if Tulsa had, would have just left her alone <laughs> and not done anything, just let her keep her business and her home. The wealth that she would have accumulated between 1921 and the time she died, which I believe was 2004, would have been $1.3 million. And, and that sounds like a lot of money, but that's the type of general wealth, generational wealth that just accumulates over time just because of the passage of time. My parents, for example, bought a house in 1975 in Silicon Valley, and, and then Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. So their house increased in value. That's, that's the whole point of owning a house is it increases in value over time. And so for Tulsa to deny the Black community of that, not once, but twice, I think is a conversation that the city needs to have. And, and we have a lot of conversations, especially now in Tulsa, about, of course, Black Lives Matter and these murals that are being erased. A few years ago, we had a conversation about naming of Brady Street and the Brady Heights neighborhood. And, and all these are these symbolic conversations that I think are important, but dismiss the, the deeper, I think, probably more difficult conversations that we need to have and maybe are avoiding as a city. Part of this is the idea of reparations for those not just who were affected by the race massacre, but also the destruction a second time in the late 60s, early 70s. But it's something that people white people like me often get very defensive about, whether it's people in government or citizens who often try to claim that I didn't do this or I didn't benefit from it. Therefore, our money shouldn't go to pay reparations. So I just, I wonder, do we approach the conversation, not in a way to make white people feel better about it, but in a way that it can become a more productive conversation, right? Sure. Yeah, I think one of the ways to do that is to take a look at in business circles or in economic development, you talk about lost opportunity costs, right? So what is the lost opportunity cost of a neighborhood that was thriving and then destroyed and took five years to rebuild? You have tons and tons of businesses and businesses all pay sales tax. You have tons and tons of thriving communities that all of a sudden You've got organizations like the Red Cross, the city and several nonprofits and churches and things like that all of a sudden have to support these families instead of these families being self-sufficient. And the same thing happens during urban renewal or as it's known in communities of color, urban removal. And again, this is a nationwide conversation that happened all over the country. Cities took federal highway dollars and picked minority neighborhoods to plow highways through. And this happened in San Jose. It happened in Chicago and Detroit and almost every major city in the U.S. has a highway that's running through what used to be a minority neighborhood. And to answer the question, what does the rest of the city benefit by reparations, is the fact that all of Tulsa has to pay for things like roads and highways and neighborhoods and the, and the infrastructure that goes in that neighborhood. So anytime you have a conversation about a neighborhood, it's always a citywide conversation. And I'll give you just a small example. A few years ago, Tulsa voted to use part of the Vision 2025 funds to repair a mile of highway in South Tulsa. I believe it was between 81st and 91st along Yale, if I'm not mistaken. What's the road that leads to Whole Foods? Is that Harvard or Yale? That's uh, Yale. Yale. Yeah, I think it's Yale. Yale. Yeah. So that one mile of road cost $39 million. <sighs> and that's something that every single citizen in the city of Tulsa had to pay for that one mile of road, $39 million. So if you divide that amongst every tax paying citizen in the city, then that's the cost that we had to pay you, me. So for some reason, it's not a big deal when we talk about paying $40 million to fix one mile of road. So like somehow that's not a big deal, but paying reparations to families who have lost generational wealth for the last hundred years, that's a problem. Like that, that's, that's controversial. I think, again, as sort of these narratives that we build as a city, I think are really important because you've got this narrative of Greenwood. And I think that, unfortunately, it's probably going to be the, the predominant narrative that we hear throughout, throughout the centennial, throughout from here all the way to May of 21 and beyond is this narrative that Greenwood was destroyed in, in 21, nothing happened since, and, and 
Why are we asking about reparations now? The reason is that Greenwood didn't go away. It was rebuilt and it was destroyed again. And, and I think when we talk about reparations, those reparations need to take into account the entire history of Greenwood and not just, not just have what happened on those two days. You were talking about narratives. I want to explore narratives a little bit because even there's like many narratives within the narrative, right? So the narrative that, you know, the Tulsa Race Massacre happened over these two days and it was terrible and we should focus on that is almost like doubly wrong because if you haven't, listeners, if you haven't read the commission report, it is dense. I would still suggest reading it because if you truly want to get angry about the injustice that happened, it was not just the lives lost. It was the insults on top of those lives lost afterwards and the inability to claim insurance, the inability to get out of the city made prisons that black people were put into mm-hmm. and only be bailed out by white people. Changing city codes to make rebuilding yeah. more difficult. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. some of the story, but that's not the entire story. So you talk about you're talking about the fire codes that were uh, rewritten. The rezoning of the Greenwood neighborhood for to build an industrial area. That was what so if you look at what basically what Tate Brady, Charles Page, Henry Sinclair and that sort of had a business network going amongst them, the sort of richest and, and most powerful people in Tulsa that were driving the business community of Tulsa. That was their plan. Their plan was let's let's get rid of Greenwood, let's move the black community further north, and let's build a second train depot on the east side of downtown to basically double the amount of commerce that can that can flow through Tulsa, flow through downtown Tulsa. That was their sort of overall overarching plan. And B.C. Franklin almost single-handedly stopped them in their track. He had a couple of legal partners, and there was another group of attorneys led by Meeks. He was a white attorney. And there were several lawsuits filed by the businesses in the Greenwood community to say that this was wrong, that the city did not have the right to prevent Greenwood from rebuilding. And indeed, these lawsuits were victorious. Greenwood rebuilt. So I think that's an incredibly important story to tell. It's equally important story to tell about the business owners who stuck around and really did great things, not just for Greenwood, but for all of Tulsa. You have people like Simon Berry, who in the 40s gifted an enormous amount of land to the city of Tulsa. And today is Lacey Park, which is a great asset for the community. John and Lily Williams, Horace Taylor. You just have so many great figures that come out of the uh, Greenwood, the tragedy of Greenwood and turn it into something wonderful that not only had a huge influence in the business community, the philanthropic community, but in the music community. Count Basie's autobiography. This is the jazz, very famous jazz artist, Count Basie. His entire first chapter of his autobiography was being in Greenwood in 1927 and listening to the music that was being played in the neighborhoods changed his entire approach to music, his entire sound, and made Count Basie Count Basie. Prince, in his autobiography, before he passed, he was working on his autobiography when he died and his editor ended up finishing it. But Prince, in his autobiography, talks about Greenwood and the wealth that it produced, not just before 1921, but after 1921. And he wanted to do something to honor Greenwood's history, Greenwood's entire history. And he talks about that in his autobiography. Greenwood is has become, over the years, a national story. And you see it in The Watchmen, you see it in Lovecraft Country, you see it in, you just see it come up over and over and over again. As far as race massacres go, and these events that happened all over the country, in the red summer of 1919, but you have the Rosewood Massacre in Florida, you have the Chicago Massacre. Tulsa wasn't the only one, but I think the reason why Tulsa is getting so much attention is because Greenwood did rebuild, and Greenwood did show an incredible amount of resilience, an incredible amount of not accepting the status quo of we're just gonna we're just gonna raise this neighborhood and never allow it to thrive again. I think the story that Greenwood resisted and thrived again despite all odds is an incredible story. I can't think of I, in our nation's history. I can't think other than maybe San Francisco's recovery after the 1907 earthquake. I can't think of a story of recovery that's more significant than the story of Greenwood. And I think it's interesting because I think Tulsa specifically and Oklahoma in general try to claim this resilient spirit, whatever tragedy hits, whether you want to call it the Oklahoma standard, which I think people use a little more sarcastically today, or what you want to call it, this, they claim this resilient spirit. And yet Greenwood, like you said, is maybe the best example, one of the best examples in history. 
and it is virtually ignored. And it's just fascinating and sad to me that this amazing story of hope it is ignored largely because of you know systemic racism in, in Tulsa and, and Oklahoma and how we teach history and everything else. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to me that even the, the descendants, I, as we've sort of one of the unexpected things that's come out of this project is that as we've released these articles, descendants of these families have reached out to us. So we've talked to the descendants of Horace Pegleg Taylor. We've talked to the descendants of Mabel Little, of, of J.B. Stratford, of S.M. Jackson. And even in the Black community, what we hear from the families, from the, from the families who've descended from people who were living during the massacre is that their families didn't want to talk about Greenwood either. And yeah. so it was really a taboo subject, even amongst the Greenwood community or even amongst North Tulsa. And everybody needs to know about this story. And I think that it would give, or at least in my opinion, the way I see it, um, and, and, the, and the folks that I've talked to in Greenwood, I think it would not only revive that uh, sense of hope, but revive that sense of we didn't give up. Our community didn't give up, didn't just take this lying down in a way. And I think that that story, really, as Jesse mentioned, narratives, I think that is a narrative that really needs to change. It's funny that there's so much energy in Tulsa around like advertising how great Tulsa is. And there's programs like Tulsa Remote trying to bring people here and lots of economic development forces to get companies to move here and whatnot. And I feel like that sense and the group of people who are excited about that, their positivity towards Tulsa is great, but also has a huge blind spot to it, which is you have all this energy and usually a lot of financial backing. Like, why don't we fix some of the things here first before we start, before we go out and start trying to sell Tulsa? Because when you try to convince people to move here, you're going to end up talking about some of these things. And so why not work on them a little bit first? And it's, it's, it's a cognitive dissonance that I would say white Christian conservative people in America have on what America is and the difference that people of color and minorities see versus what a evangelical white straight Christian would see. And I like how you keep getting more and more specific in the demographic you're talking about. I'm trying to only insult one group of people. Um, so. But this episode is going to come out two days after election day. So hopefully the world's still around. We'll find out. But Oh, because that meteor that's supposed to come close? Yeah, that, <laughs> right. that thing. Yeah. This might be the last pot for good ever. But like all these things wrap together. There is, there is the, I, the idea that people have about what America is, what America was, and what America should be. And the arguments, we never seem to have arguments about where America should be going. Because that's something technically people could actually agree on, but we keep arguing about what it is now and how we should feel about that and what it was before. I want to frame it properly because in the past two days, I've done two things I shouldn't have done. One was get into a fight on Facebook with someone. I One of my many triggers is when there's an article about the Black Lives Matter mural and there's always at least two people who pop in who say the Black Lives Matter movement is a Marxist organization, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, shut up. That's not what this conversation's about. <laughs> you don't even know what Marxism is. And I got into it with someone. I, was, I remained calm. I was pretty proud of myself. But I was like, that's not what we're talking about, man. Settle down, Jesse. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and then when you talk about the history of American politics and the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and the amendments, you realize that, yeah, some people could view that as, well, we've written this great, this great roadmap for democracy and we should stick to it. We're talking about originalism and the Supreme Court and whatnot. And I'm like, you guys and ladies, whoever I'm talking to, the Constitution leaves out a lot of people. <laughs> like it says people, but when it says people, it's only referring to white landowners. So what are we male, talking about? White male yeah. landowners. White, yeah. yes. Yeah. White male landowners. Yeah, I, I was talking to my daughter at the dinner table. We were all sitting around having a conversation and talking about the ridiculousness of th this idea of originalism. The, the constitution itself was changed a few short years after it was ratified. It's called the Bill of Rights. So here, here's 10 ways that we messed up the constitution. <laughs> um, 
And so right away, in a very short amount of time, you have the founding fathers wake up and realize, oh, wait a second, there's a bunch of rights that we left out of this. Let's fix what we wrote. And we have constitutional amendments. And so the first 10 were written very shortly after the original constitution was ratified. And, and we've had constitutional amendments ever since. There's no such thing as originalism. You, you literally can't be an originalist. It's not possible. It's an impossible position to take. You, you just, it's, it's like believing in unicorns flying around in your backyard. Like it's just not happening. Well, but you, but to, to, to answer your question about how do we move forward, I, 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 I would push back a little bit and say, that the way we move forward is to look at the past. Again, if you want to find out how to have a diverse, thriving, economically viable, amazing, diverse, mixed use, all the buzzwords, all the urbanist buzzwords, neighborhood, just look at Greenwood in 1940 and 1950. It's amazing. If you want to ask the question about how Black, Native, and Hispanic communities and families can participate in the nation's democracy, you can look at Oklahoma after Reconstruction. It was an amazing time to to be black and to be in a, in an Indian territory. This is pre statehood, but to be in an Indian territory where you were basically left alone, you were allowed to thrive. What's one of the most amazing things about B.C. Franklin's autobiography is he talks about this point in history after the Civil War and right before Oklahoma became a state where Oklahoma was this sort of utopia for minorities. And the amount of not just monetary wealth, but political power that they amassed, having audiences with the governor of the Indian Territory, having a seat at the table in what Oklahoma was to become. And people like W.E.B. Du Bois talking about Oklahoma. There was just this, this period of this very short window of time, like I said, after Reconstruction and before statehood, where, where where you you quite literally have the answer to how minorities can live and thrive in this democracy they did it there was a very similar story in virginia after reconstruction when virginia re- rewrote its constitution there was this window of time where you had 50% of the voting population in virginia was black and as soon as virginia rewrote its constitution that number dropped down to 0% the Reconstruction era was a great era for Black power, Black wealth, Black prosperity, Black excellence. And with the writing of these constitutions in Southern states, we again, we, we shot ourselves in the foot. We ruined it for ourselves. Senate Bill 1 for the state of Oklahoma. So this is, we're talking about Guthrie is still the capital. And this is 1907. But Senate Bill 1, the first order of business for the state of Oklahoma, was segregation. Senate Bill 1 says that if there's a white person riding in a train car, that a black person cannot ride in that train car with him. As soon as Oklahoma becomes a state, it becomes a racist state. And so I think that these are conversations that we need to have. We need to talk about the past so that we can understand where we got it, where we got it wrong. And I think those are the things that can inform how, how we go forward. So you, I sh- this is... The- really the first question I should have asked you, which is, as you said, you are not a, you are not a, a black man. Right. And so with that in mind, why are you spending all so much energy on trying to tell the story, tr- trying to change the narrative of the story that like, while I understand minorities, constant defense of other minorities, right? There are plenty of injustices in your own people's past that you could be focusing on. So why this? Why'd you, like, you moved from California here and now have spent time working on this. I guess the simplest question is why? I ask myself that a lot. I'm not from here. I moved to Tulsa in 98. I have never lived in Greenwood, but Greenwood did give me my first shot in my career. And when I moved here, it was the Greenwood community that really supported me as a young entrepreneur, as a young graphic designer, as somebody who wanted to make a, uh, a name and a career for themselves. It was people like Jim Goodwin and organizations like the Greenwood Cultural Center, Ruben Gant, Julius Pegues. It was the Mabel Little House. It was the Greenwood Cultural Center. It was the Jazz Hall of Fame. It was that community that really gave me a shot when nobody else would. Banks laughed in my face when I tried to get a loan from my business. White business owners, for the most part, didn't didn't get me or what I was trying to do. But the Black business community did, and the Black nonprofit community. 
understood what I was trying to do. And so in a way, this is me giving back. It's also a way to thank uh, the families and the individuals who, who helped me along. So I think that's a huge part of it. And another part of it is I am in Tulsa now. And even though, and I'll just give you a quick example, but if you look at Highway 280 in San Jose, California, where I grew up, it's a similar story. There was a, there was a thriving Mexican neighborhood that was in, near Willow Glen in San Jose. And that entire, my dad had a paper route through that neighborhood, but it's all gone now. It's Highway 280 today. And so I think that to the extent that this is a national story, I'm trying to use Tulsa as an example for what happened in many other cities. And trying to take more of a, not so much a historical approach, but more of a biographical approach. The articles on the victoryofgreenwood.com are, they're all about individuals, you know, and, and, and families. So I, I want to tell their story in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think that being Mexican and having that tradition, like many minority, we see this in Native American communities and South American communities and African communities and Asian communities, <laughs> you see this all over the place. This sort of centering on the family and centering on families supporting each other and, and forming a community. I was very attracted to that story and those narratives. And so I think that I saw something that maybe somebody like, and not to disparage their work in any way whatsoever, I think that Tim Madigan and Scott Ellsworth and John, Randy Crable have all done wonderful jobs with their books. But it may be something that they, just from their culture, they may, may be not looking at the story of Greenwood the same way that I've been looking at it. I think we could probably keep talking for another hour, but we're getting close to the end. I just wanted to give you a chance to give people some specifics on how they connect, connect the best way to keep up with the articles when they're coming out, and also how they can help if they're inspired and they want to help with this projects or other projects. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few things going on, which is very exciting. Even in this COVID madness that we're all trying to fight through, we're still, we're, we still have a lot of momentum going on for our project. So I'm very happy about that. The first thing is that we did launch our website a few months ago, thevictoryofgreenwood.com. So you can see the latest articles there. I encourage your listeners to support the Tulsa Star as well, a newspaper that was thriving in 1921. And again, Tamantha brought it back and, and is do, doing great work with her publication. We, are, we have partnered with the Center for Public Secrets over on 6th and Peoria, and we're launching a series of events. The first one, which is going to kick off on November 13th. And so we're going to have these little exhibits of photographs and documents, things that may not necessarily be appearing in our book because the, a book is just not the proper venue for it. So we, we, we found a venue. <laughs> and so the Center for Public Secrets is going to exhibit, for example, a housing ordinance that was passed in 1916 that hardly anybody has ever seen since then that sets up the, the division in Tulsa between Black Tulsa and White Tulsa. So if you want to look at why Tulsa is racially divided. There's a legal reason for that. It was written in an ordinance in 1916 that wasn't repealed until 1956. And so people get a chance to see these things and really experience them in person. I think it's it's been a great partnership and will be uh, a great series of events. So I'm really looking forward to that. We're doing events in, and these will be exhibits. So if you don't get to the center on the 13th, it'll be, it'll be there and you can go to the center. I think we're, I think the exhibits will be up for about three or four weeks, each one of them. So we're going to be doing one in uh, November, January, March, and then May. So I think that'll be a great place for people to go and take a look at what we're doing. And yeah, as far as support, uh, there's a place to make a donation on our website. If folks are so inclined, we are very heavily in fundraising mode. Uh, it's, we've got to wear that hat as well. So it's research, it's writing, it's fundraising. We're all, all at the same time. So it's it's a lot of work, but we've got a really good team behind us and I'm really proud of what we've done so far and just looking forward to continuing to grow as it has been. So I'm just really happy about that. And when's the book supposed to come out? So the book itself will be released in May of, of, of 21. So okay. it'll be in time for the centennial. Should we talk about our secret project? <laughs> Yeah, if you want to, go for it. No, no, it's really just my own gratification. So <laughs> if you support Victory of Greenwood, you might also be helping me help Carlos make a podcast series coming up. So give them money. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be interesting. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that because we really, with that podcast, we want to talk a lot more about these difficult conversations that we've mentioned throughout this hour and really take a deep dive and even hopefully maybe talk to some of the decision makers who are still around, who made those decisions about Tulsa model cities and who made those decisions about UCAT and those kinds of things. I'm excited to see if we can uncover some of that stuff as well. If, if our listeners like my rants about the federal highway system, you, you can guarantee it's going to come up quite a bit in this podcast. And if you don't like my rants about that, about the federal highway system. You can fast forward through them. Yeah. yeah. And there'll be plenty of other conversations as well. So, yeah. no, highway. no, okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This was, again, a great conversation. I wouldn't use the word fun conversation, but again, conversations that need to be had. And I think overall, we'll, you know, slowly make Tulsa better. We always like to finish up with just to see, oh, yeah. since you're dealing with very serious stuff. So what do you do to decompress? Do you have some shows you're watching do you have stuff you read for fun or listen to? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, this the work I'm doing here is outside my day job. I'm a graphic designer by day, and I'm doing all this reading and research in my off hours. So in a way, The Victory of Greenwood is my hobby, but it is tough material. I helped my friend Ann Patton work on her book about the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana. And as you can imagine, that was an incredibly difficult project to work on. I didn't write the book, but I typeset it. And even even doing the graphic design for a book like that is is tough. And it took me took me a while to, like you said, recover and decompress. Uh, I like playing video games, especially old school video games. That kind of takes my mind off of things. What am I watching right now? I'm watching uh, New Amsterdam on Amazon. Great writing. Love that show. Keepo and the Wonder Beasts on Netflix. Is an incredible series. I love how that story is unfolding. I'm a big fan. I'm still a big. F I always have been uh, a fan of animation since since always. <laughs> the first movie I saw in the theater was uh, um, Fox and the Hound, and I've just been a huge fan of animation ever since. I watch things like Gravity Falls and Steven Universe, which I think are just still even great stories that that more adults should be watching. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Fox and the Hound's a real bummer for your first animation. I got, I still remember to this day, I got home, I was just bawling. <laughs> oh, man. I must have been like four or five at the time. Oh, man. I watched that movie once and only once. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you so yes, much. thank you. Thank you all for listening to Pod for Good. I don't know how many of our listeners actually listen all the way to the end. As a podcast listener, I know I don't. But in case you made it this far, since I forgot to tell you to subscribe in the intro, I'm going to tell you to subscribe right now. Please subscribe to Pod for Good anywhere podcasts can be found. Check us out on Facebook at Pod the Number Four Good or our website, which is rant9.com. And again, Tulsa. On top of just getting it done, which is our catchphrase, if you haven't noticed yet, I would like to remind you all to, again, even if we are in a post-election hellscape, to please wear your mask. I'm out.